<laughs> Thank you, Ted. Thank you all. Now, tonight, what I'm going to do is to do what I usually do, is cause trouble. <laughs> uh, we'll try to do it on a national scale. Uh, as you know, I've been traveling up and down the country, or parts of it at least, uh, making trouble. And I've dealt with three particular themes, which I intended to deal with as national primetime television broadcasts, knowing that we would have an initial opportunity for three primetime network broadcasts, and I decided to devote one theme to each of these. So tonight I shall turn to the same theme which I addressed in Chicago, that is U.S. foreign policy, Pre presented as it should have been presented, but you never heard it this way before, from the standpoint of a crisis. Now, obviously, this, this system cannot continue. Any system which is based on a hyperbolic bubble growth of financial obligations, which is sucking like Dracula by night on monetary circulation, which is sucking all day long on people, on real income, the real economy, which must pay for everything in the final analysis, obviously the entire system is bankrupt, including the world system and the United States component of the world system. That is to say, that the international monetary and financial system is bankrupt, hopelessly bankrupt. Nothing can be done or should be done to try to save it. It's gone. What you should do is, as in any hopelessly bankrupt firm, is you should have the relevant governments put it into bankruptcy, into receivership and bankruptcy reorganization to prevent social chaos, to ensure stability. That means that the Federal Reserve System and its attached financial institutions must be put into financial receivership now. Because if we don't do that, what can happen? This thing will go. It's a bomb which somebody's kicking around in the kitchen. We don't know which kick's going to set it off, but we know the thing is ready to go off. So therefore, we've got to get rid of the bomb as soon as possible. How is it going to go off? Why is it a bomb? Because you, when it, you pop a bubble, like popping an overstretched balloon, what happens? It doesn't gradually deflate, does it? It tears itself apart. An international financial bubble, pricked by what is called reverse leverage, will explode in a chain reaction, which is like an explosion, except it explodes inwards. It's an implosion. The result of such a thing is you don't have firms going into bankruptcy you have them simply going altogether out of business. You had a bank, you had some savings over there. Well, that bank doesn't exist anymore. It's not bankrupt, it's gone. It's gone. You're sitting there with paper, with assets, countries, governments, as well as individuals. Nothing functions. Chaos. And if you may don't correct that chaos, then physical chaos, hell on earth, will emerge. So th that's the challenge. The President of the United States, the task on which everything else depends, without which everything else is a complete waste of talk. The central issue facing the President of the United States is to put the Federal Reserve System into bankruptcy reorganization and to promptly, as a preemptive move, because it's already bankrupt, before the explosion comes, and to the same time revert to the Constitution to create a new issue of currency as credit to get the U.S. economy going and create a national banking system to deliver that credit through banks which we may actually artificially sustain, functioning to get the economy moving through large-scale public works projects which are needed, not make work, but needed projects, like the water systems, the rail systems, things like that, power systems, put people to work. That will solve our problem or will find the basic feasible solution for our problem. But what about the world? And that is the issue of foreign policy. What are we going to do about the world? We can't ignore it. Pat Buchanan can ignore it, but the world will ignore him. You've got to deal with the world. Now, which means the President of the United States must call together representatives of a number of powers to enact in various parts of the world 
similar measures to those he's enacting in the United States. He must scrap existing trade agreements and tariff agreements and set up a new series of agreements which are based on protectionism for both the U.S. recovery and allowing other nations to do the same thing. Put up protective tariffs, not exorbitant tariffs, but protective tariffs which allow our farmers and our manufacturers to engage successfully in investing in businesses. That's simple. Other countries should have the same right. We should agree with them on tariff and trade agreements which serve that purpose to our mutual advantage, our mutual national economic security. That's the basic issue. They have to do the same thing with their central banks that we have to do with the Federal Reserve System. We have to enter into agreements with them on trade and tariffs and on reestablishing a system of relatively fixed parities of currency so we can foster long-term international trade and investment. Get the world economy moving again. This involves the key problem. We are now at foreign policy. What are the powers we deal with? Well, first of all, the largest power we have to deal with is called the British Empire. Now, let anybody tell you it's the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is not a nation, it's a plantation, occupied by about 5,000 people, three to 5,000 people, who are among the wealthiest and dirtiest and meanest people on this planet, who form an oligarchy. We have a couple of horse-faced relics there called a monarchy, who act as the capo de capo or whatever, you know, uh, for, the, for that bunch of, that mob of, of gangsters, the British Empire. Well, that's your Rio Tinto Zinc, Royal Dutch Shell, British Petroleum, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These interests. The Anglo-Dutch world oligarchy. Now that empire, which the British effectively control, except for a few dissident nations that don't like it, that empire represents about one-fifth of the world's land area. It represents about 30% of the world's population. It controls 48 to 50% of the world's financial turnover, including the three and a half trillion dollars a day derivatives turnover. It controls the majority of the world's international trade in what are called strategic metals, such as the metals that are required for most industry. It controls the majority of the international trade in petroleum, it controls through its ownership of Cargill, U.S. firms such as Cargill, Archer Daniel Midland, that's the firm that owns Bob Dole, and or uh, the principal stockholding in Bob Dole is Archer Daniel Midland. And that, that is a problem that Bob Dole is going to have to face in his election campaign. Combi these interests, British interests, the Anglo, Dutch, Swiss, Cargill et al. complex, controls the majority of the international food trade in a time of grave food crisis worldwide. It controls the majority of the D Republican Party leadership in the United States. Bob, D uh, uh, George Bush is, this mad dog, George Bush, is a property of the Harriman family. The Harriman family has been since the late 19th century significant in the United States because E.H. Harriman, the father of Averill Harriman, served as a nominee for the Union Pacific stockholding interests of the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII of England. So the Harriman family is actually a front for the British monarchy, his financial interests. George Bush's father, Prescott, the man who signed the check that put Hitler into power in Germany in 1933, was the chief executive officer for Harriman. Now the Harrimans control only control George Bush. They also control Bob Strauss on the Democratic Party side. So you have Gingrich Democrats and, G and Bush Democrats as well as Harriman Republicans. They're the same thing. That's the reason that the Democratic National Committee through, deliberately, intentionally, through the 1994 congressional elections. So the British Empire is a very serious proposition. Now there's some other powers on this planet. 
They're the Russians. Now, the Russians have never had a nation state. Never. They went directly from empire, from Tatar domination as satrapies, to an empire, to communism, without passing go or collecting $200. They have now been put into bankruptcy. Because the British, supported by George Bush, in 1989 said, that, well, the Russians are down on the ground. Now we're going to make sure that none of the nations of the former Soviet empire ever rise again. We are going to destroy them by reform, a mass murderous reform. And that's happening in every country. The communists are coming back to power in each of these countries of Eastern Europe because of these reform policies. People who supported the United States or were friends of the United States in each of these countries are now suffering because of the policies of the United States and are being discredited in all these countries because they supported free trade and so-called democracy, which is not democracy. So Russia has never had nation-state status, but they, have, they, they represent the potential of a nation-state, which more and more people in the place would like to have, and they ha represent power, despite their broken condition. So you have to deal with them as a primary tier world power. Mainland China is also a world power, a first tier world power. And there are no other first tier world powers on the surface of this planet. The United States, the British Empire, Russia, and China. There are no other major powers on this planet. You have countries, Western Europe is a group, Western continental Europe is a group, has potentiality. They no longer have the potentiality of first-tier independent nation-states. They've lost that. They've thrown it away deliberately. The Brussels Agreement, Maastricht, all these things, they've thrown away their national sovereignty. They're now collectively a second-rate power. So the United States has to take this international situation of first and second-tier powers and put together as a leader in the process put together an agreement on establishing a new monetary system, a new trade system, a new international credit system, in order to make us safe. Now, this requires some understanding, doesn't it? It's not so easy to do. You don't have, you're not going to talk about fairy story soap opera operations about how you get these funny people together and you have a negotiating session, a therapy group or a tea group and they all come, our sensitivity group, and they all come to an insight into each other's marital problems and they sign this international political monetary agreement. It's not going to happen. You have to understand something about humanity. And that's why virtually all diplomats and all people who discuss foreign policy are idiots. In the sense, as long as they don't, if you try to, they, they, they ought to be allowed to say the silly things they want to say and to say them as pompously as they please but they shouldn't be allowed to do anything about this stuff because they're only going to make the world a mess. Let's look at this conflict between the United States and the British Empire, which as anyone who is, was educated in my generation knew, there are a couple of wars we had with the British over this issue. We didn't have a war with the British because of this reason or that reason. We had wars with the British for, as for independence because we had a fundamental philosophical difference with the British, the British on the moral question, the British Empire, the British monarchy. What's the quarrel? Well, let's go back to empires. What is the British Empire now and how does it compare with empires of the past? What's the issue here? What's the policy question? The British Empire consists, like the Roman Empire, or the Persian Empire before the Roman Empire, or the Babylonian Empire before it became known as the Persian Empire, of a small oligarchy gathered around some kind of an imperial monarchy, ruling over a number of subject peoples. Among the subject peoples, one of the people was chosen as the chosen people, the dominant nationality. This changed from time to time, even though the empires continued. 
That was the model for the Roman Empire. That was the model for the Byzantine Empire. That was the model for the Russian Empire, for the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire, the Spanish Empire. Groups of subject peoples living in satrapies, colonies, and so forth, under the domination or of a leading power, with all of which was controlled by a ruling oligarchy of either a feudal landowning or a financial aristocratic type, with a bureaucracy running the whole show and a monarchy, replaceable monarchy, used at the top to, as sort of the chief gangster to keep the other gangsters in line. Just like the British monarchy. The Ottoman dynasty was a continuation of the, of the Byzantine dynasty. When the Byzantine Empire would collapsed, the people inside the Byzantine Empire brought the Osman dynasty to power, and the Byzantine Empire, which had never been completely Christian anyway, became predominantly Islamic. It was a change in dynasty. Nothing else had changed. The British Empire is a continuation of that, not so much as a feudal form of aristocracy, feudal form of, of oligarchy, but rather a financier aristocracy form of government. But it's still an oligarchy. Now the difference is this. The difference is knowing the nature of man. What is a human being? Is a human being a zoo animal with certain instincts and impulses which must be allowed to continue these peculiarities? Or is a human being what the Genesis 1, especially 26 or 30, describes it? As a creature unique in the respect that is made the, in the image of God and given dominion over the universe. In that interest. Is every human being that? Well, he is, of course. We can prove it. It's not a matter of theology. It's not a matter of arbitrary doctrine. It's a matter of fact. Now, if man were a higher ape, at no time in the past two million years did the conditions exist on this planet for more than three million individuals of such a population, even the most gifted. Well, we had, by the middle of the 14th century, we had over 300 million people on this planet. We have today over 5.2 billion people. We're only supposed to have three million. Age, adult life, uh, old, uh, probably 18, 20 years at best. Infant mortality, enormous. That's what we're supposed to have. We're supposed to be scratching around like that, picking up nuts, grabbing things that float on the beach, eating carrion, whatever. That's what we're supposed to be. No, we are, we're something different. How? Because we are capable of doing something which is typified by fundamental scientific and technological progress. We're capable of making axiomatic or revolutionary discoveries of principle, which can be transmitted as dis acts of discovery from one person to the next, from one generation to the next. These changes, these discoveries of principle, increase the human race's power over nature. As a result of that, our potential population increases, our life expectancy increases, our health increases, okay? health conditions. Demographic characteristics of population increase. You have, a, you have time for more development of human beings. For example, if, if the life expectancy is modally 35 to 45 years, who can be educated for 20 to 25 years? What child? Who's going to support the child in that kind of education? Only if you have a demography which has a life expectancy of 80 or so years can you have a population which can enjoy modern civilization. Because without universal education, which takes someone up through the age of university level today, you don't have parity in knowledge. You don't have the adequate development of the human individual. You need to produce enough. You need to have that kind of life expectancy, that kind of population density, to have what we have achieved in the best condition today. That's man. The basis of foreign policy is to recognize two things. First of all, that it is impossible to have modern society except through the institution of the sovereign nation state. It is the sovereign nation state which enables us to do the things we've done to raise the human population level 
from 300 million in the 14th century to over 5 billion today. With existing technology, or technology which existed 25 years ago, we could sustain comfortably on this planet 25 billion people, each living in a standard of living comparable to what we enjoyed in the latter half of the 1960s. That's a, that we, and we could do much better than that. That's only the beginning. It's a nation state that brings us to do it. Now, without the nation state, you cannot participate in government. You have no right to participate in government. Well, if there's no government that you control, how can you participate in it? To participate, you must use the medium of language. To have important ideas, you must have a literate form of language. If you cannot communicate with a literate form of language, common language, how can you share the discussion of ideas with other citizens or with the government itself? How can you have law? if you don't have comprehension. Therefore, the nation state, we have learned, is as a sovereign entity, is the highest form of political organization which can be tolerated on this planet. What's the problem there? Well, in the State Department, a leading number of people there, as does George Bush or Henry Kissinger, believes that with the fall of communism and in the aftermath of Desert Storm, led by Sir Colin Powell, a, a good British servant, that the United Nations is now the world government. Why is what is being done by the IMF and World Bank in the Middle East or in the Balkans, why is that tolerated? The argument is in the foreign ministries of the world, including our own State Department, that the United Nations is the world government. <coughs> that the United States is merely a satrapy of an empire called the United Nations Security Council world government. A world government which the British, through their empire, largely control. Now, of course, any State Department official who believes that must be considered either insane or treasonous. Because our Constitution prescribes that our government, our sovereign nation, our sovereign national personality is the highest form of political institution to be tolerated on this planet. And that every other people have a right to the same kind of institution for themselves. And that relations among sovereign nation states must be the basis for relations among peoples on this planet, relations of law. And what is the purpose of that? The purpose of the nation state is to establish what is decreed by Genesis 1, 26 to 30. That man, the individual person, is made in the image of God to exert dominion over this planet. It is our concern, therefore, that a, a civilization fit for mankind is one in which every individual is given the opportunity to realize that sacred potentiality. And that the good that the individual does, as inventions, artistic discoveries, or otherwise, or merely transmits to their children and others as teachers or parents, that that good shall be protected to the benefit of present and future generations. It is the right of every person to die with a smile on their face, saying that I have lived, and as the New Testament prescribes, this life, this life which is embodied with creative reason, to assimilate the knowledge from the past by reenacting it, to transmit it to the future, is a talent. The beginning and end of my life, my mortal life, is a talent which I must return enriched above what was given to me. And if I have enriched that talent, if I have given back to mankind at least as much as I received in terms of this talent, and perhaps a bit more, then I can go to my grave with a smile on my face.
because my life was necessary. And I have lived a life which satisfies the requirement of Genesis 1, 26 to 30. I have walked as a created person in the image of God. I have exerted dominion and helped the human species in its assigned duty of exerting dominion over this planet. That's the purpose of foreign policy. To bring about a state of, on this planet of sovereign nation states in which such persons can become such individuals, such citizens of their nation state, can participate in their government, their self-government, through the medium of a literate form of common language and common understanding. That we can have a system of law based on reason, not arbitrary authority, where everything has to be proven, where truthfulness has to be determined, not popular opinion, but truth which is the only protection the individual has against the hazards of an adverse popular opinion. Truth. And to bring about a condition on this planet where humanity is organized in such nation states. And each nation state is protected in its right to pursue this course and objective. Therefore, we must destroy in ourselves any axiomatic assumption any belief that there exists any race among men except the human race. We must destroy any assumption that man is anything but this creature made in the image of God, which has this talent, which has this responsibility. And we must create institutions and protect institutions which allow every newborn baby to have access to become that kind of person and to live as that kind of person. A society which protects the good contributed by its dead, its former members, to the benefit of present and future generations. That's what the game is all about. Politics is taught in the political science texts and so forth is nonsense. Real politics is this. Real politics is the struggle for truth, the struggle to find and preserve institutions of self-government of mankind by which we may bring forth on this planet a durable arrangement consistent with this nature of the human individual. That's real foreign policy. Thank you. First of all, I, as I've said today to a group of legislators here in the state of New Hampshire, I'm not, even though I'm running for president, I'm not a rival of Bill Clinton. That's the wrong way to put it. It has wrong connotations. I just said we have a division of labor. We don't agree on many things, I think. We do tend to agree on some things. I have supported him as president uh, while always keeping my own views clear. But for me, politics is a process. I think this year the Democratic Party again is the party which must be rallied to take the leadership in this process for the nation, for reasons I shall indicate to you tonight. And thus, my concern now is twofold. First of all, we're going to have a Democratic Party convention in August in Chicago. As of now, the Democratic Party is in no shape to have a convention. It has no idea of what to do about any of the important questions of life in the United States. So therefore, between now and convention time, during the primary campaign, we have to bring into, into the dialogue considerations which the Democratic Party National Committee at present would chiefly abhor. But we're going to have to change that. You recall that last, late last year, there was a Million Man March in Washington as a result of that march, there are over 300 organizations around the country built around veterans of the march which are attempting to organize people in the African-American community in particular uh, and around things like voter registration. We have in a subsequent period, we have a, a proposal from groups which represent Mexican-Americans in the California and the Southwest 
and Puerto Rican and other Spanish-speaking or Spanish heritage Americans in the area around New York City and New Jersey, which are moving to have their own Million Man March. We have, as a result of Gingrich, the, the man who stole Christmas, we have many senior citizens and organizations of senior citizens around the country who are also on the march, knowing that their very lives may depend upon eliminating what Gingrich represents in our national political system. We have also many other groups, including a reactivated AFL-CIO. It's a small organization, much reduced now from what it used to be, but it's reactivated. Remember, Gingrich and his crew was elected by less than 25% of the people, of the voters. Over half didn't bother to vote. And Gingrich and his crew of freshmen do not represent the majority of Americans. They represent about 25% at most of the U.S. Vote, of the US eligible citizens. So they're an easily defeatable process. My concern is to mobilize not only thinking people who are already in the Democratic Party, but to sh show to them that there are many other people in the country who will naturally gravitate to the Democratic Party as a way of stopping what Gingrich represents and what Phil Graham represents and what Steve Forbes represents. And thus, it's possible that if we can get new ideas out, particularly bringing them to these kinds of constituencies which I've identified, that we can transform the Democratic Party so that what will come out in the course of the latter part of the year and into next year will be far different than we face today from Washington. We have faced in this country the most frightening world crisis which has existed in this century, a worse crisis than World War II represented. The entire world monetary system and the attached financial institutions are collectively bankrupt. We don't have a budget crisis. We have a collapse of the tax revenue base. The taxes have been dropping, rate, tax rates have been dropping since the end of the war. Remember what the tax rates were in the 1950s. Remember what the tax rates were in the, on income in the 1960s. What they were even in the 1970s. So people are not, not facing a great growing tax burden in this country. No, the tax burden is less. Per dollar of income, the tax burden is less on everybody, especially the rich. No? So there's no problem of growth of big government taxes. That's a complete fraud. That doesn't exist. What there is is a collapse of the tax revenue base. That the income of people, the income of industry, the income of the agricultural sector has collapsed. And therefore, these groups in the population, which are businesses and individuals, have less income than they had before. And therefore, they can pay only lower rates, of, lower amounts of taxation at the existing rates. Whole sections of the economy, such as the speculators in Wall Street, are virtually untaxed. So what we have is we have a dying economy which is no longer able to support itself. And instead of saying that the policies which led us to this collapse were wrong, and we should change those policies and go back to the kind of policies that work, people are saying, no, we have to cut pensions, we have to cut this, we have to cut Medicare. Now, that's not acceptable. And it's, this, it's not just not acceptable. This is Hitler thinking. And I'm not exaggerating. What Newt Gingrich is, is a Hitler-style criminal. His entire mafia are Hitler-style criminals because they are proposing policies which take entire categories of people, including senior citizens, young unwed mothers, et cetera, et cetera, and propose policies which result in an increase in the death rates in that section of the population. They are killing people as much as if they killed each person individually with an ax, but they're doing it with a pencil or a personal computer in Washington or with an artist or somebody who's running a personal computer, not with the ax. 
If you kill somebody by subterfuge, it's the same as if you kill them by some other means. It's murder. And the respect for the individual person and the right for life is the sacred principle upon which all, all of our society depends. Once we lose that, once we stop treating our fellow human being as ha being sacred, their life is being sacred, and fighting to enable them to live that life to the fullest, we're no longer human. We're no longer decent. We've become like animals. And that's what's happening to us. So we face a moral problem. And the reason I reference this moral problem is not because of its inflammatory character, but because it goes to the heart of the matter. Our problem today takes the form that the world's monetary and financial institutions are collectively bankrupt. That is, per capita and per household, the income of families' households has collapsed in physical terms. I'm talking about market baskets of physical consumption, quality of education, quality of health care, quality of scientific and technological services. In that respect, the income of Americans today is about half of what it was 25 years ago. This is reflected in a change in family structure. And many people will talk about family values, but they're hypocrites. Because I recall, as many of us can hear, what a family structure used to mean. It meant a family household which was essentially supported by one working member of the family. It was a family household in which the relationship to the children and the neighbors were defined on that basis. It was a family in which the return of a parent, a male parent or others, to the household at evening was occasion for joy. It's not the amount of quality time you spend with your children, as it's called these days, that counts. What counts is whether the child is overjoyed at the prospect of the parent's return to the house after being away. So it wasn't the amount of time or the number of things or the number of toys and so forth that you brought home that counted. It was the loving relationship within the household which constituted the essential nurture of the household. And that's been destroyed because now it takes two and a half jobs in a family to maintain a standard of living. So those who talk about family values and don't consider these matters are just using words and not addressing reality. National economic security. We used to have a national economic security policy. We came out of that without a World War II, and we learned it largely during the war. Not that it was a new idea during the war, but during war, as some of you recall, we started with almost nothing. I recall 1939-1940 when the first mobilization, steps of mobilization were being cranked up. We took businesses, and they, some up here too, shops of various kinds which were junk heaps. People who represented largely lost skills, lost during the depressions. And then we gave them a chance to get a try on a government subcontract. And we told the bank to give them a chance by getting them a little credit there to see if they could make it. Now, some of them didn't make it, but others did. And out of that process, we build up, within two to three years, an industrial machine to, su to supply for the sinners of war, which is the greatest industrial machine on this planet, out of our garbage heap, because we mobilized to do it, and we can do it again. We realized, though, out of that experience, out of the experience of the 1930s, that we had to have a concept of national economic security. That meant full employment, national economic security. That meant things like the Hill-Burton Act, that every community must have hospital facilities which are accessible to it, which provide for that community. We had to have a policy of protecting our vital national industries. These were basic American ideas on which the success of this nation was based the protective tariff. Every patriotic president was for the protective tariff. The Whig Party, out of which the modern Democratic Party comes, as well as all decent Republicans, comes out of that tradition of the Clay Carey Whigs, 
of the early 19th century, of John Quincy Adams and James Monroe and Lincoln and people like that. McKinley was part of that, too. The McKinley Tariff of 1890, protect American industry. Under those conditions, we emerged repeatedly as a leading world power. We established the highest level of income in the world under these policies. We didn't hurt anybody by doing that. These protectionist policies were good for us, and they were good for others who imitated us in doing it. We could cooperate on trade agreements with nations which were doing the same thing and find that nobody was hurt. We just had to be sensible. We've gotten away from that since 1966. We now have free trade. NAFTA must come to an end. Free trade must come to an end. GATT must come to an end. World Trade Organization must come to an end. And the system of finance that ruined us over the past 25 years, that must come to an end. We must say that the national economic security, the protection of the employment, the health, the essential industries of the United States as a sovereign state is the prime base of national domestic economic policy. The fostering of national income through investment in scientific and technological progress for the test of improving the standard of living and productivity of the American people. That's the foundation on which we solve all our material and related problems. Now let's look at the, the same policy internationally. I'm involved deeply in a number of countries and have been for a number of years. I've been involved for many years. I was, first got the idea during World War II when I was in India serving an Indian uh, CBI theater, China, Burma, India. And I saw the conditions of life of people in British colonies. I saw the way they were treated. Not merely the material conditions of life, but the way they were treated. They were treated as dogs. Or better than, or worse than we would treat our dogs. Now, I didn't know what Roosevelt was saying at the time, but I found out later. It was the same thing I thought, the same thing many of us thought at that time overseas. That this, we had just come through the greater part of a war, a great war, a very frightening war. We had much sacrifice. We had lost many friends and neighbors in that war. Other countries had lost a great deal. Now, if we, I said, Others said, as Roosevelt said to Churchill, we cannot allow colonialism and the British Empire and British methods, the methods of Winston Churchill, to continue in this world beyond this war. Because if we allow this, there will be no security for the United States or any other nation because these conditions can lead to a new source of conflict and danger to civilization. Therefore, we must end colonialism with this end of this war. All of the colonies of the British, the Dutch, and the French must be given back to the people. Colonialism must end. British 18th century methods must go from this planet, and American methods, the methods of the American Revolution and its tradition must be made available to every people and every nation on this planet. And when the time came that I was, became influential to some degree in politics, I began to become involved in this question, this unresolved question of my wartime service. The concern of justice for the so-called underdeveloped or former colonial nations, that our security as a nation, our protection against the dangers of war engulfing this planet again, lay in committing ourselves to destroying those things in this planet which denied justice for the greatest part of this human population. So I know what goes on in the world. I'm involved directly and indirectly daily with most of the countries of South and Central America, with most of the leading countries of Africa, with the Middle East, with every country in Europe, with the territory of the former Soviet Union, Russia, Ukraine, and so forth, with China, with Japan, and so forth and so on. And I can tell you that the policies which we find oppressive here in the United States, the murderous and mass murderous policies of Gingrich and his crew, are the policies which can bring great danger 
to the United States from without, as the United States in its isolationist phases has been shocked to find a danger from the outside before. And Americans have said, don't worry about the world outside, we've got too many problems at home, are being very foolish. Because the problems you ignore in South America, in Central America, in Africa, in Europe, and Asia can come here in such forms as Chinese thermonuclear missiles and other forms. I'll give an example in just one anecdote, which is probably important for you to know. As you probably do know, when President Clinton was campaigning for the presidential nomination and election in 1992, one of the planks of his platform was a moral concern, which he shared in large part with people like Bob Dole on the Republican side, a moral concern to bring about justice in the Balkans, an end to this mass murder. It was a good idea. The president was committed to that in 1993 and 1994, but why didn't it happen? The United States is the world's leading power. Why didn't it happen? Because the British and the French and the Mitterrand had created the Balkan War as part of the same policy we, on which they dictated successfully to the cat on the tail of fascist broom, George Bush, to destroy the nations of Eastern Europe, to destroy the Balkans. And they unleashed the Serbians, who were assets of Mitterrand's faction in France, and but primarily of the British to commit genocide against the neighbors in Croatia and in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Pure genocide on orders from London and the support from France. And therefore, the United States could get no support from British or French on getting peace in the Balkans. As a matter of fact, the British and French did everything possible to sabotage the attempts of the United States to bring about an end to the war in the Balkans, and still do. Therefore, the United States had no active support in West, among its Western European allies for peace in the Balkans. So the United States went into the so-called Dayton Accord negotiations for peace in the Balkans, having assembled there Serbians, the government of uh, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, the government of Croatia, and the contact group, that is, the Russians. So what could be negotiated between the Russians and the Americans with the consent of the Croatians, the Serbs, and the Bosnians became the Dayton Agreement. Now, obviously, this is a somewhat unprincipled agreement, which cannot work by itself. Therefore, it could only work if the United States and other forces would put troops into the Balkans as guarantors of the peace, to enforce the peace. The United States also agreed to ante up a kitty that has taken part in putting a kitty together for about $3 billion in aid to Bosnia to rebuild its infrastructure and get its economy moving again. Two things happened to that aid. And don't let any Republican tell you that the president goofed up in Bosnia because it was the Republicans who stopped that aid which was necessary for that to happen. But some, that wasn't all that happened. That is, the Republicans sabotaged the peace in Bosnia and then said the president had, had made a bad deal. And this was Gingrich primarily and his friends. Secondly, the, the aid to Bosnia from multinational sources was channeled to the World Bank. And the World Bank said, no, we will give Bosnia the $3 million which is being raised for them. But first of all, they have to pay $5 billion of the Serbians' debt. And that's what happened to the Bosnian situation. In other words, we could have a war breaking out in Bosnia, in the Balkans again, because of the World Bank. Now, the issue is here is not as some Republicans would tell you, that the President made a mistake in putting the U.S. military into the Balkans. That's a lie. He made no such mistake. The mistake was in not putting the military in the Congress to get rid of Gould Gingrich. <laughs> of course, he couldn't do that by law, but that would have been a good idea. <clears throat> and a lot of people in this country would have been happy with that. The problem was that the United States 
failure in the Balkans is not failing to deliver money, though that is a problem. The problem is that we are supporting Adolf Hitler against his victims. Adolf Hitler, in this case, is the World Bank bureaucracy, which says that the Bosnians, who are the victims of Serbian aggression, including genocide, will not get a penny of the aid offered to them unless they give $5 billion to pay off the Serbian debt. And the United States does not denounce the World Bank and break off relations with the World Bank, does not break off relations with Adolf Hitler. We are failing to realize that the people of Mexico, of South America, of the nations of Africa, of the Middle East, of the Balkans, of the former Soviet territory, also have a right to national economic security and to respect for those measures which they must take in terms of trade and tariff agreements to bring about that economic security. So what we are doing is by following the British in this kind of policy, which is the old 18th century, 19th century imperial policy, imperialism in a new form, against the billions of people who should be our friends, we are turning a world of which we are normally the leaders into our enemies. What we must do is to recognize the commonality between what is right for us and what is right for others and base our domestic policy and our foreign policy on the same principles. This is not a matter of giving away large sums of American money to foreign countries. This is giving them their rights to solve their own problems with cooperation with us. And that's national economic security. And that's what we've turned away from. But these vital issues which I've raised, for example, tonight, they're not being addressed. We're living in virtual reality, not reality, in terms of our mental life. We're not paying attention to business. Now, what's needed there is, is for someone to do the terrible things that I do, more people, is to go out and insult my fellow Americans, but in a loving way. Say, look, you guys have been behaving like idiots. You're like the guy who went back to the same used car dealer that sold you the car without the engine last year and you bought it again. You've got to realize that you may not have concocted these evils, but you who have a brain who could have used it should have gotten wise to this racket before now. So why don't you give up the idea that everything has to be simple, everything has to be stupid, everything has to be in bite-sized answers, and let's talk about it, and let's think. You got a question? Ask it. Something's confusing? Demand clarification. But you must, in your own mind, know what this is about. Not necessarily all the technical details, but you have to know what it is for which you should vote, what it is you should demand of candidates and representatives, and why. You should know what the mistakes were, were in policy that got us into this mess and be resolved not to repeat it. You should refresh yourself on the history of the United States to find those things that made us great as opposed to those things which made us bad. And we should tap our resources because we were the best nation on this planet. Other nations envied us because we were the best. We also were very bad. But among all the bad nations, and they were all bad, we were relatively the best. Now, what, forget what made us bad for a moment. What made us good? And perhaps what made us good is a thing to which we must return and to eliminate all the things that prevented us from continuing to do those things that were good. Let's make reforms and changes where they should have been made, let's not make the changes which eliminate what should not have been eliminated. Let us not throw out the baby instead of the garbage. Thank you.
You're sitting there with paper with assets, countries, governments, as well as individuals. Nothing functions. Chaos. And if you may don't correct that chaos, then physical chaos, hell on earth, will emerge. So th that's the challenge. The President of the United States, the task on which everything else depends, without which everything else is a complete waste of talk. The central issue facing the President of the United States is to put the Federal Reserve System into bankruptcy reorganization and to promptly, as a preemptive move, because it's already bankrupt, before the explosion comes, and to the same time revert to the Constitution to create a new issue of currency as credit to get the U.S. economy going and create a national banking system to deliver that credit through banks which we may actually artificially sustain functioning to get the economy moving through large-scale public works projects which are needed, not make work, but needed projects. Like the water systems, the rail systems, things like that. Power systems. Put people to work. That will solve our problem, or will find the basic feasible solution for our problem. But what about the world? And that is the issue of foreign policy. What are we going to do about the world? We can't ignore it. Pat Buchanan can ignore it, but the world will ignore him. You've got to deal with the world. Now, which means the President of the United States must call together representatives of a number of powers to enact in various parts of the world similar measures to those he's enacting in the United States. He must scrap existing trade agreements and tariff agreements and set up a new series of agreements for a few dissident nations that don't like it. That empire represents about one-fifth of the world's land area. It represents about 30% of the world's population. It controls 48 to 50% of the world's financial turnover, including the $3.5 trillion a day derivatives turnover. It controls the majority of the world's international trade in what are called strategic metals, such as the metals that are required for most industry. It controls the majority of the international trade in petroleum. It controls through its ownership of Cargill, U.S. firms such as Cargill, Archer Daniel Midland, that's the firm that owns Bob Dole, and or uh, the principal stockholding in Bob Dole is Archer Daniels Midland. And that, that is a problem that Bob Dole is going to have to face in his election campaign. Combine these interests, British interests, the Anglo, Dutch, Swiss, Cargill et al. complex, controls the majority of the international food trade in a time of grave food crisis worldwide. It controls the majority of the D Republican Party leadership in the United States. Bob, D uh, uh, George Bush is this mad dog, George Bush, is a property of the Harriman family. The Harriman family has been since the late 19th century significant in the United States because E. H. Harriman, the father of Averill Harriman, served as a nominee for the Union Pacific stockholding interests of the Prince of Wales agreements, which are based on protectionism for both the U.S. recovery and allowing other nations to do the same thing put up protective tariffs, not exorbitant tariffs, but protective tariffs which allow our farmers and our manufacturers to engage successfully in investing in businesses. That's simple. Other countries should have the same right. We should agree with them on tariff and trade agreements which serve that purpose to our mutual advantage, our mutual national economic security. That's the basic issue. They have to do the same thing with their central banks that we have to do with the Federal Reserve System. We have to enter into agreements with them on trade and tariffs and on reestablishing a system of relatively fixed parities of currency so we can foster long-term international trade and investment. Get the world economy moving again. This involves the key problem. We are now at foreign policy. What are the powers we deal with? Well, first of all, the largest power we have to deal with is called the British Empire. Only may tell you it's the United Kingdom. 
The United Kingdom is not a nation, it's a plantation occupied by about 5,000 people, three to 5,000 people, who are among the wealthiest and dirtiest and meanest people on this planet, who form an oligarchy. We have a couple of horse-faced relics there called a monarchy, who act as the capo de capo or whatever, you know, uh, for, the, for that, bunch of, that mob of, of gangsters, the British Empire. Well, that's your Rio Tinto zinc, a Royal Dutch shell, <laughs> British petroleum, et cetera, et cetera, these interests the Anglo-Dutch world oligarchy. Now that empire, which the British effectively control, except Thank you, Ted. Thank you all. Now, tonight, what I'm going to do is to do what I usually do, is cause trouble. <laughs> uh, we'll try to do it on a national scale. Uh, as you know, I've been traveling up and down the country, or parts of it at least, uh, making trouble. And I've dealt with three particular themes, which I intended to deal with as national primetime television broadcasts knowing that we would have an initial opportunity for three primetime network broadcasts, and I decided to devote one theme to each of these. So tonight I shall turn to the same theme which I addressed in Chicago. That is U.S. foreign policy, Pre presented as it should have been presented, but you've never heard it this way before, from the standpoint of a crisis. Now, obviously, this, this system cannot continue. Any system which is based on a hyperbolic bubble growth of financial obligations, which is sucking like Dracula by night on monetary circulation, which is sucking all day long on people, on real income, the real economy, which must pay for everything in the final analysis, obviously the entire system is bankrupt, including the world system and the United States component of the world system. That is to say that the international monetary and financial system is bankrupt, hopelessly bankrupt. Nothing can be done or should be done to try to save it. It's gone. What you should do is, as in any hopelessly bankrupt firm, is you should have the relevant governments put it into bankruptcy, into receivership and bankruptcy reorganization to prevent social chaos to ensure stability. That means that the Federal Reserve System and its attached financial institutions must be put into financial receivership now. Because if we don't do that, what can happen? This thing will go. It's a bomb which somebody's kicking around in the kitchen. We don't know which kick's going to set it off, but we know the thing is ready to go off. So therefore, we've got to get rid of the bomb as soon as possible. How is it going to go off? Why is it a bomb? Because you, when it, you prop a bubble, like popping an overstretched balloon, what happens? It doesn't gradually deflate, does it? It tears itself apart. An international financial bubble, pricked by what is called reverse leverage, will explode in a chain reaction, which is like an explosion, except it explodes inwards. It's an implosion. The result of such a thing is you don't have firms going into bankruptcy, you have them simply going altogether out of business. You had a bank, you had some savings over there. Well, that bank doesn't exist anymore. It's not bankrupt, it's gone. It's gone. 